everybody. Good morning. I recognize some faces here. Thank you for coming, and uh, many I can't wait to get to know. Um, I'm a little overwhelmed, uh, just crying over here during worship. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, some of you know a bit of the journey, and uh, God's so good. God's so good. He, he is unbelievable, and he's mysterious, and he's great, and he's wants to be famous, and uh, it's a little overwhelming. It's a little overwhelming. <laughs> Don't cry. Okay, okay I'll stop now. Uh, so, so we're, we're going to continue in Philippians. Let me tell you a little bit more about my family. I, there's my family. They're also over here. Uh, yeah, Dennis said Lillian 15, Levi's 12, Lara is 7, and um, you know, I just got to that's just right off the bat. Lori and I were married when we were 12 and 10. <laughs> because we're actually celebrating our 21st wedding anniversary this week. Yeah. So we're really excited about that. And I've been told over and over I looked a little younger than, than that. Um, but that's okay. That'll pay off down the road someday. So we're going to press on with Philippians chapter 2. We're in this series called Joyride. And... Um, Boy, it's apropos for my life, and it's a little apropos maybe for you. Didn't want to cut that short. We want to get through Philippians, but let me tell you what's coming, because I want you to anticipate what's coming. We're going to get through Philippians this month. It's August. I can't believe it. Uh, kids go back to school and all that jazz. Um, we're going to get through Philippians. We're going to push the gas pedal a little bit faster to get through Philippians. Not to skip over verses and rush through it. We're going to, we're going to take our time. But then when we get to September, October, and November, we're going to probably head into the book of Acts. And we're going to take our time to get to the book of Acts and sort of go back to the first church. And what was the first church all about? And where was the foundation laid? And what were they about? And how did the church expand? And what was that whole thing about? I can't wait to get in the room with, with Dennis and, and the two Dans and Blaine and, and a few of others and wrestle with what, what could that look like for our church to look at the book of Acts and plow through that. And then by the time that's done, we're going to be heading into Christmas. And before you know it, we're talking about Christmas in August, but actually the sermon kind of connects with that. I'll tell you why in a little bit. But then we'll be in Christmas in, in 2016, and it's going to be crazy. But I wanted to let you know where we're going. The rest of this month, Philippians, then we're going to head into the book of Acts, uh, Lord willing, and then head into Christmas time. I am so blessed to be here. I can't wait to see uh, what God does in and through us. And I mean us. I don't mean me. I mean us, because we're the church. And we need to together Together, we need to, to figure out what is God up to at this time, at this place, at this, this location, because Belmar and beyond needs Jesus, and we need to figure out what that looks like, and so that obviously we're in a transition time, we're going to sort some things out and figure it out, but and it's going to feel a little different, look a little different, obviously we're going to have some worship teams coming in on the weekends that feels different, um, before we settle on who the person that would be helping us lead in worship down the road. We're going to be wrestling through some order of worship. I hope that doesn't throw you off too much. Um, even Dennis did a little bit different, a little prayer time today. And I know you, you are used to other things. So I hope you're open to whatever God wants to do and however he wants to lead and however he wants us to advance the kingdom in this place and beyond. And we've got some big vision, actually, we've been praying about. I've been praying for you. Um, you know, I, I've been having some conversations with Dennis this past week and and we've been praying and not knowing exactly where we might land. And I just want to tell you with all my heart that I've been praying for you. I love you. I can't wait to get to know many of you more. Um, I mean that from the bottom of my heart. And so we are going to do this thing together. And I look forward to seeing how God blows our expectations away. Ephesians chapter 3 stuff. Like do a CD more than we can ask for or imagine yeah. kinds of stuff. Is that what you want to see happen? Yeah, yes. yeah I do. I do, and there's no one church on, on the planet that can do all of that. Not one local church. It takes many local churches. So I look forward to seeing what God has in store for us here. If you turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2, and I do hope you have a Bible. Uh, it might be on your phone. You might have an app called Bible um, on your phone, and that's awesome. I'm glad, glad you have that. Uh, or you might have that old-fashioned kind like this, where it's you know that book that you need to flip and and you could write in or underline or asterisk or highlight. I hope you have a Bible, though. If you don't have a Bible and you want one, please come talk to me. Talk to somebody on staff here. Talk to a volunteer. We want to get you a Bible. 
because it's life-giving. It's living and active. It's sharper than a double-edged sword. It, it penetrates marrow from bone. It, it, it's not just a history book. It's, it's living and active. It's the Word of God. So I want to make sure you have a Bible one way or another. And I hope you bring it with you each week because that's what we're going to study. We're not going to st study other things. We're going to study what the Word of God has to say. So in Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to rush ahead here. Starting in verse 5 is where we're going to, we're going to dive in. Uh, I hope uh, you're just anticipating what God might do this morning in your own heart. Let's pray together. Father, we know that you're already present. We don't even need to pray for that. We don't even need to pray for your presence to be here. It's already here. Because if we're believers, we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. You're already present. But I do pray in a unique kind of way that you would actually have your way in our hearts. That you would change us. This would not just be going through the rote motions of religion. But this would be coming into a space here, collected as the body of Christ. And for those who are wrestling and might be mad at God or... Or, or don't we even call themselves religious? They may not even know who Jesus is. I don't want to assume anything in this place. But I do pray that you change our hearts. That you would have your way. That you would, as you've already tenderized our hearts through music and worship, that you do the same thing through your word. Do that in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, raise your hand with me, everybody. Everybody. Hey, how many of you have ever had a bad attitude? Phew! Thank you. Thank you. I thought I was the only one. Thanks for raising your hand and doing that. I appreciate that a lot. See, sorry, a little, little, little trick action there. I understand. But you know what? I, I'm tempted to have a bad attitude all the time. I, I actually sometimes fall into having a bad attitude. And the Bible has something to say about that. We're going to talk about this this morning. And, you know, maybe you can relate to these things, maybe you can't, maybe, maybe this is just me, but I'm just going to be vulnerable and transparent and honest with you this morning, I hope that's okay. I'm not going to try to put on any facades or anything, because I'm just a guy who's trying to live for Jesus just like you are, but boy am I tempted to have a bad attitude. I mean, this week I'm driving to church, I'm on Kipling, I'm coming down, and uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have driven down Kipling, and you notice on the right hand side there's all these turn lanes. You know, you merge over to the right, like a normal driver, and you put your turn signal on, and you get off right there. And then there's another one after that, and another one after that, and another one. You know what I'm getting at. So you're supposed to get over in that lane, I think, if I remember my driver's head correctly. You're supposed to like, turn, turn signal on, get over there, put your turn signal on, and you get to turn off. Well, I'm driving down Kipling, and I'm in, I'm in the right-hand lane, the normal lane, and I see this guy in my rear view mirror come on the right side, and he's coming up beside me, and sometimes, you know, they speed up before they slow down to turn. He didn't slow down. He blew past that turn, blew past that turn, blew past the next turn, left-hand turn signal in front of me. So he's just using that lane to pass me. And I was tempted in that moment to have a bit of a bad attitude. I'm not going to tell you what I was thinking in my head. I'm, I didn't say anything out loud, but there was something happening in my head, like a little wrestling match. I might have even hit my horn, I'm not sure, I don't remember. Um, you know, when my kids don't put their, their laundry in the laundry basket, I can be tempted to have a bad attitude. I'm not going to look at them right now. Um, or, or when my wife asks me to take out the garbage. You know, I'm sitting on the couch, for me it's soccer, I'm watching soccer, and she asks me to take out the garbage. You know how long it takes me to take out the garbage at my house? 30 seconds, I timed it once. 30 seconds. So why is it that in that moment when she says, hey, would you take out the trash, there's something inside me that goes, mm, 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 I don't want to do that. What is that? Well, that's my sinful nature is what that is, but I'm tempted to have a bad attitude. Or a friend who turns her back on me, I'm tempted to have a bad attitude. Or a boss who doesn't treat me well, I'm tempted to have a bad attitude. Or, or if things just don't go quite the way that I thought they were going to go. I'm tempted to have a bad attitude. I mean, these are all you know, hypothetical situations for me. Uh -huh. No, they, they really happen in many, many more. But maybe you can relate to maybe being tempted or falling into a bad attitude. Uh, maybe you're tracking with me. Years ago, there was a commercial on TV. I played tennis in high school, and uh, so I was really into this dude. His name was Andre Agassi, and he had a sweet mullet. You know, a sweet mullet back in the day. And there's this commercial going on for Canon Camera. I don't know if you remember it, and he dipped tennis balls into paint, and then he slammed them up against the wall and kind of made this kind of, kind of beautiful picture out of tennis ball paint slamming. And so he, he does that, and it's taking pictures in the commercial, taking pictures of this whole thing. And the whole slogan of the whole commercial was, image is everything. You 
Remember? Image is everything. I mean, think about that. You wake, I wake up in the morning, what about you? I wake up in the morning, look in the mirror and go, I'm not, really? Image is everything? Because it's not looking good right now. I gotta go do some things to make sure that looks a little bit better. Or image is everything, like I need to present myself to everybody in a certain way so that they'll like me better or, 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 or feel better about me. So I need to, image is everything, really? Image is everything? Or there's another commercial by Sprite that said, obey your thirst. Talking about Sprite, obeying your thirst. You're thirsty, get a Sprite. Obey your thirst because, man, obey your feelings. Obey what, you know, what you're drawn towards with your feelings and what you want to experience. Take that out to its nth degree. If any of you have been alive at all for any length of time, you know that if you take that principle out to the first extreme, you're going to go places you don't want to go. You're going to end up with a life you don't want to live. You're going to go to places where you, you, you go with your feelings every time, and then you end up down, well, a sinful path that you didn't want to be down. And you know, sin takes you further than you ever wanted to go and keeps you longer than anyone ever wanted to stay. It really does. And I think, man, look what the world's saying. Image is everything. Obey your thirst. But the Bible says something else. It's the title of the sermon today. I think attitude is everything. Attitude is everything. Maybe you would consider yourself not to be a very religious person. Maybe maybe you're here, uh, you haven't been here for a while and you're coming back. Maybe you're here and you're wrestling with God. You're mad at God. Something's happened in your life right now where you're just kind of mad about that whole circumstance. Maybe you're, you're questioning Christianity or wondering about Jesus or you're, you have questions about the Bible that you haven't quite figured out yet. Welcome to the party. Welcome to the club. I'm glad you're here because I do too. I'm on a journey with you to, to keep growing closer and trying to figure out what this whole Christian thing is about, what, what Jesus is all about, and how to follow him every day. I'm all about that. And so welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Because Philippians chapter 2 is for everybody. Whether you're non-religious, religious, you know, you know, come from whatever background you come from, because everybody deals with attitude, don't they? Everybody. It doesn't matter who you are. We're all wrestling with whether to have a good attitude. Now listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, our example is Jesus. And so we look to see what he was about, what he said, how he acted, and that's our, that's our role model. That's the guy we want to follow. So Paul lays it out very clearly in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. Follow along with me. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Who being in the very nature of God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And I say amen, and we can go home now. I mean, I mean, that's it. It's pretty plain. It's pretty straightforward. You don't need a lot of explanation, but you know, maybe I'll take a little bit of a shot at it. Hey, picture this with me. Jesus, he's not bound by time or space, but he's the second person of the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Son is Jesus. Jesus is, let's just say he's in heaven. He's not bound by time and space, but let's just say he's in heaven. He's being worshipped in heaven. This is before he comes to earth. He's being worshipped in heaven. Like the songs that we just sang, as beautiful and awesome as they were, and thank you team for leading those songs, as awesome as they were, don't pale in comparison to the way heaven's going to be someday. I mean, there is not going to be any harmony problems going on like I would have if I was singing up here. I don't have those gifts and abilities. I can sing in the shower, make joyful noise, but, you know, I, I'm not going to be up here leading worship anytime soon. There's not going to be any of those issues in heaven. But picture Jesus is in heaven. They're worshiping him. They're, they're worshiping. He's part of the Trinity. He's in on the creation of the world, Colossians says. He was there. It's hard for us to get our minds around. It's a mystery because we just picture Jesus as a human man. But before he was a human man, before the incarnation, Jesus was in on creating the whole world. So when the Bible and the Psalms say that, that God commands the lightning bolts where to go, and he, he had the, the, the earth as his footstool, which just really means he's really, really big. Okay. That's what it means. 
Let's cut to the chase. That's Jesus. Jesus is in on that because he's God. He's part of the Trinity. That Jesus who's there makes the decision on the divine calendar of God and in God's redemptive plan to save the world. He would leave that comfort place to come to earth. It's Christmas. It's Christmas. And I'm just looking over here at your baby. <laughs> and I'm just crying. Because Jesus left heaven to come in the form of that to save us from our sins. Is that unbelievable or what? It's unbelievable. You can't get your mind around that idea. I mean, Jesus, I think, drove an Omni. Do you remember those cars? <laughs> Omni is a little golf, little, you know, those little tiny little cars. My sister used to have one when she was in college. I mean, the Omni. Why do I say that? Because, because he was omnipotent. Um, omnipotent. Yeah, sorry about that. So he's, he's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omniscient. He's all knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. That's Jesus who leads there to come to earth in the form of a vulnerable baby. That's what Philippians 2 is talking about. It reminds me of a Disney movie, and every now and then I get some good theology from Disney movies. Aladdin. Remember Aladdin? When Aladdin's having this conversation with the genie, and the genie describes who he is, that Robin Williams voice, and he describes it, and, and he comes out of the, the lamp, and he's huge, and he says, I'm this phenomenal cosmic power. It's easy to live in this case. You remember that scene? Phenomenal cosmic power decides to leave and come into the form of an itty bitty little baby for the sake of saving the world. Is your mind getting around this yet? Are you understanding what's happening here? Now let's start to dissect Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 5. I think there's two reasons here why we need to have a good attitude. Particularly if you're a follower of Jesus, here's our motivation, here's our model, here's what Paul says about Jesus. He, he says, first, two reasons. First, because of Jesus' pain on earth. That sounds kind of strange. I think it's because of Jesus' pain on earth that motivates us to, to actually want to have a good attitude. Because look at verses 5 and 6. Even though Jesus was God, he gave up his rights as God in heaven and came to earth in the form of a baby. Even when he grew up and became a man, he could have called down legions of angels at any second if he wanted to. But he decided before he even left there to come here that he would give up his rights and not do that. To limit himself, to become a human being and go through all the stages of... I mean, you can't even imagine this because he didn't have any sin in him all. But he went from baby to toddler to all the way through. Did he stub his toe? Did he, did he cry? Did, I mean, what was that like? He went all the way through. He went through something that didn't even exist back then. I can talk more about this. But adolescence didn't even go through that phase. And he was God anyway, so it would have been perfect. And went all the way through that thing. All the, you know, college age, young adult, all the way through became an adult. He went through every stage that you and I go through to be like us, to relate to us, to limit himself as God, to coming to earth. Verse 7, he laid aside his glory. He could have come as a knight in shining armor. He could have, he could have just appeared just like Adam did. Like a little, little, little dust thing, a little dirt thing, and boom, there's a man. Could have done that, but he didn't. He chose to come as a baby. He come to do, chose to come and do it like Christmas. In verse 7, he became a human servant. And eventually, you know, he modeled and washed the disciples' feet and show off what it was supposed to be like. Listen, you guys, listen, listen, listen. The upside down kingdom is, is not about climbing the corporate ladder. It's about coming down off the corporate ladder. It's about coming from way up high to coming down to be a servant. Which means you have to die to yourself a lot. It means you have to come out of your comfort zone a lot. It means that you might have some personal preferences around whether it's Sunday morning or some other ministry or something else, the way the church looks, or, or your own personal life, whatever else. And we all have our own personal preferences. But if you're going to be about the kingdom of God, that means you come down off the ladder and come on down and, and, and become a servant. Why? Because if your attitude is going to be the same as that of Christ Jesus, that's what he did. That's what he did. Verse 80, humble himself, becoming, coming down to sinful earth. Why would he do that? I mean, if you had a choice between staying in heaven and all the glory and all this stuff, or coming to earth, what would you choose? Yeah, me too. 
but he chose to purposely leave that space to come down and be one of us so that we would eventually come to know him. And in verse 8, he died on a cross, the worst capital punishment of all time in the history of the world. He could have come at a different time. He could have come like during the French Revolution and it would have been guillotine that he died by. He could have come during the time when, when there's a, like, a firing squad. He could have come like today and it would have been like lethal injection needle. Is this weird to talk about or what? But he came with a symbol that's back here and on churches to show off no, that's the way he came. Some of you probably wear it around your neck. It's kind of weird. You're wearing an instrument of execution around your neck. How weird is that? Maybe you'll have a little turn in your thinking around this thing, but the worst capital punishment of all time, I could go into the details of how Jesus suffered. That's what he left, that place to come to earth to eventually die for us in our place, the stuff that we deserve. This is the upside down kingdom of God. And then we turn corner on verse 9. So the first reason I think we've got to have a good attitude is because Jesus' pain on earth. Here's the second, because of Jesus' gain in heaven. Pain on earth, gain in heaven. Watch this. Paul turns the corner with this word, and in English it's the word therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore, you stop and see what it's there for, right? And the reason that word therefore is there is because of everything he just said in the first few verses. Therefore, as a result of everything I just said, that talked about Jesus end up humbling himself and going to a cross, listen to this, people. Verse 9, and God exalts Jesus to the highest place. That could be the resurrection. That could be he didn't stay in the grave, he rose from the dead. It could also be the ascension. So there's the resurrection where he rises from the dead, but then you know, he spent some time, about 40 days, and met with hundreds of people, told them all about him, and confirmed what he said he was going to do. Yep, he did it. He rose from the dead. He tells everybody, uh, to, you know, here's what discipleship looks like. You guys need to get after it now. And then he ascends and leaves them. The angels still standing there going, what are you guys doing? What are you looking at the clouds for? Let's get after it. Let's go. So they start to get after it. And there's where the book of Acts takes off. But he ascends to heaven. So this could refer to the resurrection or the ascension. Where Jesus goes back to the place where he started from. Where he would come to earth on a rescue mission. And then he went back home. By the way, are any of you homesick for heaven? <laughs> if you're getting too comfortable here. If you're settling in, if you kind of like your space where you live, or you kind of like the thing you drive, or you kind of like the paycheck, or you kind of like this other stuff, and you're settling in on that space here on this planet, you might be getting too comfortable. Because this isn't our home. We're aliens. We're foreigners, the Bible says, as believers in Jesus. We're just passing through. It's like on the eternal spectrum of the calendar, it's like a nanosecond compared to all of eternity. So there's good news coming for believers. We're going to go home. The same way Jesus went home, we're going to go home. We're going to be with him for all of eternity. If you know him. You homesick for heaven yet? Are you kind of tired of the suffering and the stuff going on? Maybe in your own personal life and your physical life or with your friendships or with other stuff? Because the good news is there is a place waiting for you, Christian, where you're going to get to go home and be around that. Isn't that good news? Amen. It's good news, and, that, and that's where Jesus just went. And then we get to the end of verse 9, it says, He was given the name above all names. It's probably the name Messiah, or Redeemer, or Deliverer, or Rescuer, because that's why He came. The Bible declares He only had one mission, to come and seek and save sinners, to save the lost, to get them found, so they come to know Him. That's why He would choose, He chose to leave heaven and come to earth in the form of a vulnerable little baby, in order to grow up the way we would, so we would relate to him. And what, what a, God is so brilliant, isn't he? That he would send Jesus in the same way that you and I were born, which would cause you to go, huh. And then he speaks with authority and all this earthly teaching, and you start to kind of pay attention to what's going on there. And then verse 10, someday, all will acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. Someday, when everybody on the planet dies, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, there will be a day when everybody acknowledges that he is the king. Now don't be confused by this verse because people misconstrue and twist this verse all the time to, to believe in universalism. That everyone's going to be saved in the end. That's not true. That's not true. What this is acknowledging is maybe, just pretend for a second, that you're an unbeliever. 
Pretend that you're an unbeliever, you don't know Jesus, maybe you've heard the gospel, maybe you haven't, but you don't know Jesus, and, and you live somewhere on planet Earth, and, and you've gone through your whole life, and uh, you, you have decided, or maybe, you know, you're not going to accept Jesus as your Savior, and you die. In the moment, instant moment that you die, all of a sudden, your eyes are going to be open, and you're going to recognize it see who Jesus really was, that he was the King of Kings, he was the Lord of Lords, everything he talked about was really true, and in that moment, I would not want to be that person, because in that moment, you're going to fall on your face and beg for mercy, and it's going to be too late. That's what this verse is talking about. There will be a day when everyone acknowledges that he was who he said he was. Listen, don't let that day be too late. I mean, I'm just new with many of you, and I know some of you, but I don't certainly know all of you, and so I'm not going to assume anything. If you've not given your life to Jesus as your Savior, do it today. Ask Him to forgive your sins, so you can know that you know that you know that when you when you die, you're not going to be that person who goes, oh man, I blew it. No, you got it right. You understood who Jesus was. Don't let it be you, and it happens to and don't be tricked into thinking that everyone's going to be saved in the end. They're not. They're not. So, listen to this. He's the one who came on a rescue mission from the haven of heaven to the birth on earth. You can write that down. He's the one who came on a rescue mission from the haven of heaven to, the, to, birth, to, to his birth on earth. I mean, he's the one who came out of there. That's why attitude is everything. That's why if you're a believer in Jesus, your attitude, your thinking, your eyes ought to be fixed on Him all the time. So that you're, you're, there, there isn't, you know, your default is, man, I'm going through some tough circumstances right now, but my eyes are fixed on Him. Because He's the author and perfecter of my faith. Who for the joy set before Him endured the what? The cross. The cross. Yeah, He endured the cross. Scorning and shame. We don't have time not to have our attitudes be fixed on Jesus. We don't. As I said, it's a millisecond. Your life is a millisecond compared to all of eternity. We don't have time not to get after the gospel. We don't have time not to build relationships with the people around us in order to tell them about Jesus. We don't have time not to try to advance the kingdom in this area of Belmar and beyond. We don't have time not to do that. We don't have time, because none of us knows when our time is up, so we, we don't have time. You, there, there ought to be this, this motivation to have your attitude be so much, so close to Jesus, and so fixed on Him, that you want the whole world around you and beyond to know Jesus as their Savior. That's why this church exists. Did you know that? I mean, if there's a bottom line statement, here it is. A great attitude for the King brings a great magnitude for the Kingdom. A great attitude for the king brings a great magnitude for the kingdom every time. Think about that. If you're around a co-worker or somebody who doesn't know Jesus, and your attitude is one of upbeat and positive and joyful for the king because Jesus is your king, your attitude, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be contagious around you. And it's automatically going to cause magnitude like an earthquake, a shockwave to happen through. And the kingdom is going to advance. And it has to. It's going to. That's the way it works. That's the economy of the kingdom of God. When your attitude... But the king is fixed on that. The magnitude of the kingdom is going to advance. It's true every time. Listen to this. Imagine if this church were to love God with everything we possibly have, individually and together as a church. What if we what if what if, what if we love God with everything we had, which meant that we actually sacrificed, we served one another, we served people that in our need in our area. We, we reached out to people, leave our own comfort zones, uh, what we might feel comfortable with, and leave that to go minister to others. What, what would happen if this church did that? What if we love people like that, and, and we sacrificially love people? Like What if, what if we, we figured out what the, what the discipleship process is around this place so we can know from cradle to grave that everybody is somewhere on the line and we're all growing closer to Jesus on this discipleship path? What would happen I think, I think that God would use that. And I think that there would be some excitement around that. And I think that that's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And I, I'm just guessing, but I think that's the kind of church that you want to be a part of. And you might want to ask other people to be a part of a church like that. Anybody else with me? That's, 
That's what it comes down to, doesn't it? You know what I just said? I just said love God, love people, and make disciples. Let's do that. Love God, love people, make disciples. Let me get really specific. If there was some specific application for you today, let me just get specific and drill down in a, a few people in the room. If you're married and you're a man, why not beat your wife to do the dishes this week? Why not do that? If she might pass out and her jaw might be on the ground, you might have to call 911 and get an ambulance there, but it would be for a good cause, okay? Because you did the dishes before she did, and she didn't have to ask you for help. What if you're, what if you're a child, uh, and you're living with your mom or your dad or, or your guardian or whatever, what, what, if, what if you, as a child, tried to outserve your parent or guardian or grandparent? What if you tried to outserve them this week? What would happen, friend, if you wrote a letter to another friend or you texted a message to another friend and it was just a note of encouragement? Maybe, maybe, maybe that was a text, maybe it's an email, maybe a Facebook thing. Maybe, maybe it's that, the thing, you probably don't remember this, but the old-fashioned thing where you get a pen, you write on a piece of paper and you fold it and put an envelope with a stamp. Remember that? And you mailed it off to somebody. And just, I was just thinking about you, praying for you this week. Just do that. Really practical, tangible things that you could do this week. And it would be so much fun to hear those stories. I'd love to hear them. You can email me or talk to me or tell me next week what happened. Just kind of go on a little mission this week. Have an attitude of Christ in the little things just to bless people around you. And see what happens. I guarantee the kingdom's going to advance. That's the way it works. And if you're a believer... Boy, can I just say this to you? You ought to be doing that all the time anyway. It ought to be on the, on the mature curve for you. Great attitude for the king brings a great magnitude for the kingdom.